Well, I am a. Oh. Now the recording is in progress. It will be here soon. Okay, sorry. So my name is Wanda Schwal. I'm a researcher at the Department of Political Science at the University of Vienna. And um, this lecture today is part of a lecture series at the department, the so called EPV lectures. Um, and Specifically, it is the, the second lecture in our series, COVID-19 Vaccination Practices, A Matter of Solidarity. Um, that series was kicked off by colleague Katharina Paul, who's also here I saw, and by another colleague, uh, Stephanie Johnson from University of Oxford. And uh, they talked about our um, comparative uh, qualitative research project, um, Solidarity in Times of a Pandemic. Um, so um, I also want to give a special thank you to Katharina Kieslich, who organized the Solidarity and COVID-19 series and also um, helped with organizing today's lecture and invited our guests. And um, so far, um, I'm now very much looking forward to today's talk. Uh, thank you, David and Claire, for being here. David and Claire Seemark both studied medicine and were trained as general practitioners. On top of decades of practical experience, they've also engaged in research. Um, both have been associated with the University of Exeter. And David C. Mark's first degree and PhD was in biochemistry. And after his medicine studies, he was a partner in the Honiton Group practice in Devon for 25 years, as was also Claire. Um, in parallel to his um, practical career, um, David published papers on end-of-life care in the community, community hospitals, chronic disease management, and opiate use in chronic pain. Um, Claire uh, was also trained as general practitioner in London, and um, she, she was also a partner in the Honiton practice, where she's still working. Um, and for years, she's also done research with Dave and other colleagues on the topics mentioned and she's also undertaken individual work on the topic of teenage pregnancy um, for which she also completed a research master's. Um, now she continues to work in the practice and to develop her interest in women's health and contraception. Um, both Claire and David and Dave sorry have previously been involved in phase four studies of influenza and swine flu vaccines. So um, now I want to give the floor to the two of you. Thanks for being here and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Well, fingers crossed. We'll just share our screen. Oops. Just bear with us while we try and get to the start. Maybe it's picked up the wrong one. Sorry, it's picked up the wrong one. I don't know. Yes, I think it has. Sorry. Oh, I've done that. Oh. Sorry. Oh, no, it's fine. T take your time. It says with um. I'll stop share for a minute and I'll try again. Let's try once with, more. We had it sorted. We had it already just <laughs> now with Cass, and then it's sort of gone a bit AWOL. This is one we want. Slide share. There we go. I know, I know. I'm trying. Okay. Can you, okay, great. Can you, you see, see it? Is it the yeah, time? we can we can see it. Right. Good. But maybe it, it's not in the um, you know in the presentation mode. Um, maybe you can click. Ah. Is that it? Yeah, but now we also see the next slide. <laughs> okay, now we'll get to the well. Um, that should be okay, I think. Let's leave it at that. I think. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, that's that's right. <laughs> yeah. Our experience isn't that. Great at this. Time. No, I see. Wait, can you I see. 
I, no, we can see it. It's, it's totally fine. Go okay. ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you very much for inviting us. So we're really talking from our basic experience of what it's been like um, helping to roll out the vaccination program in practice. So um, this is a disclaimer that we're not um, involved in a bigger scale on doing it and things, but we've learned a lot, I have to say, in the last few months. So first of all, um, we wanted just to talk about... Um, sorry, just a bit. I haven't quite started. The history of vaccination in the UK. I mean, it was very interesting because we did come to the talk um, last month about um, people's reaction to vaccination uh, in uh, uh, different countries. But we have the impression that British people have quite a long association and even affection for vaccinations over many years. We've all been brought up with vaccinations through our childhood and through um, campaigns, particularly for polio vaccination and smallpox. Um, I'm sure many of you will know the history of some of the vaccinations, but smallpox, which has been around for about 12,000 years, although fortunately we, as a um, mankind, we do seem to have got rid of it, but it was around for a long time and killed many people. And they realized that once you'd had smallpox, you weren't likely to get it again. And they tried inoculating people with a small amount of smallpox to try and stop them getting the, the, the main illness. Well, it worked to some extent, because only one to 2% of people died as compared with a, nearly a third of people who actually caught smallpox. But it did have some other side effects and problems as well. So what happened next was that particularly in country areas um, and around where we live in a country area in the Southwest of England, people began to recognize that if you'd had the condition cowpox, which came from cows, um, you often then didn't catch smallpox. And there's a guy called Benjamin Jesty, who apparently is supposed to have used it on his family back in the 18th century, and they were all fine. Um, but it took a chap called Edward Jenner in the UK to formalize the approach um, when he realized that the um, dairy maids who were getting a lot of cowpox didn't get smallpox. And he thought he could use their cowpox to inoculate um, a young boy and then try and give him smallpox. And fortunately for Edward Jenner and for the young boy, it worked. This is just to try and uh, keep the talk light and things. Edward Jenner was obviously very interested in cows and the dairy maids and cowpox, but he also uh, has been credited as one of the people who discovered what cuckoos do, that they actually get rid of, uh, lay their eggs in other birds' nests and get rid of, and then the um, young cuckoo hatches and gets rid of the other eggs. So, um, it took a long time for it to be proved, but it um, demonstrates his sort of ability as a, what we probably call a polymath in this country. So this is the Temple of Vaccinia, which is the glorified name for this small summer house building in um, Gloucestershire, where Edward Jenner was brought up in this, this little village, lived there, and that's where he first vaccinated somebody. So it is quite an important place in British medical history, and a lot of British doctors, us included, have made little pilgrimages there um, over the years. And it's now there's a, a developed museum and everything there as well. Uh, Claire, sorry to interrupt, um, but I think um, we cannot see the next slides. We only see the first slide. Sorry, oh, I do apologise. Right, sorry. Um, yeah, now no, we can see it. Okay, I'll put, that's right, I'll click on here. So this is the cuckoo, sorry, this is the cuckoo and the dairy maids anyway. So yes, sorry, having given you, told you that you're going to have pictures to look at. Um, and the this is the temple of, oh, is this one coming up? Oh, yeah. Are you seeing the um, temple of Axinia in Berkeley, Gloucester? Yes, we see the temple of Axinia. Lovely, good. And can you now see the side effects? Now we see the side effects. Lovely. OK, so side effects were always a concern with vaccines. So as you can see early on, people thought they were going to turn into cows if they were given cowpox. So it sort of reminds us that there's nothing really new in the world uh, and certainly in the world of vaccination. Yeah, so this is Edward Jenner wrote his inquiry into the cause and effects of the variola vaccinae, which is the um, disease known as cowpox. But I was very thrilled to find as well 
that it caught on very quickly in Vienna as well. And a Dr. Pascal Josef Ferro, who was born in Bonn, vaccinated his three children in Vienna in 1799 when he received some vaccine by letter from London. And it was only the second place outside England where it was used. So that's really nice connection I found um, together with what we're talking about today. And as I said, can we see this one? Yes. Yeah. Can you see it? Okay, so on the right hand there is a very young me. So this is 35 years ago when I worked in East London. And this is a measles vaccination campaign. And we went round in a bus to schools because we were concerned that measles vaccine wasn't as high as we would like. So it's partly to illustrate that um, vaccination campaigns aren't particularly new to us or new to the UK, and I'm sure not particularly to, to um, Austria either. But that. So in the UK, this, this is the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, hopefully that's come up, which is an independent expert advisory committee that advises um, the health departments. Um, you're probably aware that um, in Britain, we have slightly different things going on between England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, and they run things slightly differently. But basically, the Joint Committee makes a lot of the recommendations and advice on vaccination schedules, and it's been going for 50, nearly 50 years. So they usually meet about three times a year to look at vaccinations that are going to be needed for children and for adults and all, everybody else. But obviously this year, the last year, they've been meeting much more often. And they're the people who advise us and tell us really what we're going to do as um, doctors and general practitioners in the National Health Service. Um, so we're, we're guided by their advice. And as you're probably aware, I'm hoping, is this showing the priority groups? It does. It, it's, it's working fine. If you click on it on the left side, we can see it all. Okay, good. So um, this was the priority groups that the Joint Committee on Vaccination came up for for the UK, based on the fact that we were getting a lot of obviously mortality, particularly in the older age groups and in care homes. So um, this was their groups one to nine, um, starting with residents in care homes, old adults and the carers of those older adults, and then working down in age groups and adding in the frontline health and social care workers. And then at number four, we included the clinically extremely vulnerable, who are the people who had been advised to shield during the pandemic. And then a bit lower down, we got to the people who we would usually probably be giving flu vaccines in our usual um, flu years. And gradually down to those who are over 50. So those were the groups that in our practice that we undertook and agreed that we would be involved in um, vaccinating basically. Um, the younger age groups are going to probably be mainly vaccinated in um, larger centres, which Dave will explain in a minute. But it was felt that these nine groups would um, hopefully represent 99% of preventable mortality from COVID-19. Um, so this is a thing called the Green Book, and it used to actually be a green book that used to arrive in our GP surgeries, and it would tell us all that we needed to know about immunizations and which ones to give. Um, now it's all online, and which is fortunate because it means they can update it quite quickly and regularly. So they've had to slip COVID-19 in as number 14A in the diseases and vaccinations. Um, and this is, gives us our up-to-date advice about what we're going to do with the vaccines and um, re responding to all the concerns and things that go on. So Dave's just going to explain now a bit about the, um, the different ways it's been rolled out in this country. Yeah, thanks, Claire. So um, the UK has um, opted for a two-tier two system of uh, vaccination, that a local and a national scheme. So the local scheme is administered by primary care or general practice, as we would say. Um, it includes general practices and uh, some selected larger pharmacies. And in the main, COVID vaccination has been arranged through uh, groupings of known as the primary care networks. Now, each PCN uh, covers a population of around 30 to 50,000 patients. And uh, they are responsible in a sense for covering uh, the vaccination requirements of that group. Um, just to note that every uh, legal re resident in the UK has a right to be registered with a general practitioner in a general practice. 
and it's thought that at least 95% of, uh, of the population is registered with a GP. So there are also services uh, available for those with less secure uh, situations uh, and illegal immigrants are being encouraged to be vaccinated without uh, fear of uh, penalty. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the, the way we're handling it in East Devon. Uh, as you might be aware, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccination came online first in Britain at about the start of December uh, 2020. It's a very um, delicate uh, vaccine. It's an mRNA based vaccine. It has to be handled carefully, it needs to be frozen at minus 70 degrees centigrade. And it can then be kept at, uh, when it's brought up to a refrigerated temperature, four to eight degrees centigrade, it can be kept for five days in that state. Um, and then it, once it's been uh, diluted in the vial, it has about a six hour window of use. So as you might imagine, this vaccine is not being distributed to every general practice site in the country because of the uh, cold chain requirements. It's also quite delicate. Um, the, the vaccine cannot be dropped because it's an emulsion between lipid and uh, aqueous solution that disrupts it. So when we receive it, the vial, we have to uh, turn it carefully 10 times. We have to add uh, a pre-specified amount of uh, saline type solution into the vial and then invert it another 10 times but not shake it and then we can start to use it and we administer 0.3 of a mil into uh, the, uh, the deltoid muscle. So it's um, also uh, has been associated with some anaphylactic reactions during the trial period. It's not a, a common reaction fortunately but it has necessitated uh, a ruling for Britain, certainly, that patients who have had the vaccine should wait 15 minutes and be observed by um, a medically trained or a clinical person um, in case of the allergic reaction. So for us, we've been using in East Devon a local tennis, leisure and tennis club, uh, which is a designated facility, which had enough room for the parking, which is quite an issue. And uh, for the queuing to get in, the administration and the waiting afters. I think maybe the next slide. So that's the, uh, uh, the situation for the Pfizer BioNTech. For the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, it's uh, based on an adenovirus uh, vector. It's more stable and can be kept and stored at four to eight degrees centigrade, can be transported uh, again with care. Um, and once the vial is started, again, it has a six hour window of use. Um, and we administer half a mil into the uh, deltoid muscle. Again, people are asked to wait if they're driving afterwards in case of a reaction, but they're not asked to wait in the building and they can wait in the car park under the uh, observation of a car park attendant in case there's a, a particular problem. So this has enabled, uh, this vaccine has, has can be used in smaller premises like our general practice building and most uh, practices have been working at weekends to minimize disruption to the general working of the practices. Um, there's also the question of those who cannot get to a centre because they're housebound um, or they live in care homes or they've got particular learning disabilities etc. So the GPs have been the main provider of the domiciliary visits as we call them. So care home uh, visits uh, involve vaccinating staff and residents um, in one big session usually. And in the learning disability home vaccinations, uh, again, we've been working as uh, sending mobile teams around. And then our practice has had around 120 extra people to visit at home to, to give vaccine to because they're unable to get out of the house. So. Um, I was just going to touch on the, the advantages in the sense of the local system uh, that all GP practices in the UK are computerized and hold patient registers, which um, can be searched on a number of uh, formats, certainly for age and sex, um, and also for uh, various chronic illnesses. And if the data is recorded on body mass index, so we can search for obese patients. 
Um, and this is what's actually um, we're doing at a practice level. We're searching the databases according to the cohorts that we've been instructed to look for. And we get the list up and then it's quite laborious, but patients are contacted mainly by telephone to start with, especially the older groups, the 80s plus. For the younger groups who are carrying smartphones, and we have a number for them, we're text messaging with a direct link on the message to the booking system so they can book themselves in, or a dedicated telephone number at the practice, which they can phone and get their booking. I mean, the advantages of, of we feel, of general practice system as we have it in Britain is that very often patients are known to their doctor and to the staff who, who are on the front desk and the front line. So hard to reach groups can be targeted and then personal calls can be made for the, for the hesitant uh, patients. And it is convenient for patients to attend the local practice. I mean, our, our bigger center for the Pfizer BioNTech is 20 miles away from Honiton where we are based. So that's quite an ask for some people, but many people are flocking there. Um, so that it's no real problem, but it is convenient for those who are unable to travel too far. Thank you. The national system is in parallel and it's organized in large centers such as race courses, cathedrals, mosques, showgrounds and exhibition centers. There's um, a system of issuing batch letters according to the cohort that's being um, called in. The reason we can do this is that because all the patient notes from general practice, all the patients are also registered on a national spine, as we call it, which is a national database. So these centres can search the national database for the age groups concerned and uh, send out large batches of letter, letters. And on that, there are details of online and telephone booking options. At the time of booking, they are made appointments are made for both the first and second vaccines, uh, which is unlike in primary care, where vaccine supply is a little less reliable. So we can only make appointments for the first, first vaccine and for the second on a second occasion. So it is more laborious and time consuming. There has been some overlap as well. So pa patients have received these letters from the national system at the same time as being contacted by the practice. And of course, sometimes they're in conflict because they'd rather go just locally than having to go to a race course 20 miles away. But in the main, we seem to be covering the bases. And I feel that there are, we don't seem to be missing many people at all from this, this, uh, this approach. So um, also the national system has started to be, in a sense, broadcast through the media and online, such as that when the next uh, cohort is open, people can directly contact uh, through the website. And when they announced last week that the 45 plus years old cohort was open, the site uh, crashed very rapidly because as such was the desire for the 40 plus five year olds and over to, to get their vaccine. So um, it, is, it is seeming to get through and work. Um, and the advantage of this system is the advantages of scale and extended working hours, which helps working people. Um, but it is more impersonal and there's less convenient in terms of the distance traveled. Thank you. Um, I thought I'd just touch on uh, vaccine hesitancy as we're, we're, we're calling it. Um, it is unusual in our experience. And I think overall the, 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 the UK figures uh, confirm this. I mean, in our practices in the primary care network, uh, so far, we have vaccinated around 95% plus of the top nine priority groups with, with the first dose, and we're well underway with second doses now. Um, all patients in the top nine groups have been contacted and offered a vaccination, and we make at least two attempts to contact the patient. Uh, we find that expressions of hesitancies uh, often disappear when, when, when a person has actually received the invitation. We've had anecdotal evidence of this, that those who have been saying they will not have it, when they get the letter, when they get the phone call, they've changed their mind. Uh, family encouragement um, or a phone call from their own GP has often produced a change in mind, or at least a grudging agreement. 
sometimes it's their family pressure and they say, oh, we'll do it for their sake. So in that way, I feel that we're probably looking at 5% or less of actual vaccine refusal in, 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 the, in the long run. Claire's gonna okay. speak a little bit about how we uh, record vaccination now. So as Dave explained, and we have an NHS digital and everyone's um, NHS number and date of birth is recorded on the spine and a bit of information about them. But we then have this specific vaccine um, website now called Outcomes for Health. So every vaccine that we administer is put onto this website. And all we need to do it really is a person's, preferably the NHS number, but if not their name and their date of birth. And then we confirm that we've got the right person with their address. And then we enter the vaccine, which one we've given um, and details about it. So this is the sort of what the website looks, looks like. So we um, log into it and um, it's, it also records the last flu vaccine they've had as well. Um, we're not quite sure what other services, but I'm sure there's going to be other vaccines on there as well. But it's a relatively new service. So this is actually my um, COVID vaccination template that I got up. You may not be able to read it, but it shows I had my first Pfizer-BioNTech on the 6th of January and my second on the 4th of March. And it's and my flu one before in October. So it's, it's very clever. If you try and put in a first one uh, or if put in a second vaccine before they've had the first one, it will tell you and things. Occasionally, the system crashes a bit, um, but most of the time it's very accurate and is good at recording uh, and robust at uh, recording the data. And then what we have every day is this is something we've been having since the beginning of COVID. We have this like dashboard that's on our national news at least two or three times a day, which tells us how many cases there are in our area. And it also, sorry, mouse is going to walk about. Um, it puts up, uh, it's all slightly complicated because each country records death and tests and everything in slightly different ways. And we also have changed it over time, but basically it gives us a fairly up-to-date um, idea of how we're getting on, how many new cases we're getting, how many people are in hospital, how the trends are going, and particularly how many vaccines. So this is from Sunday. So we were up to 32 and a half thousand. 13 and a half million had had their first vaccine. You can't see the number of second on there, but it's, it's over 10 million now. And then they also put this one up, which shows you what's happening, which I'm sure you're all familiar with similar ones in your own countries and things. But this, but, um, appears on but this is on the news twice, at least twice a day, every day. Um, and it's just, doing, it's also on our websites and you can log on to any time, but you can also log on and see what's happening in your own area. So um, that's uh, it's great encouragement to people, and when you, especially when we tell them they're going to see their vaccine appearing tomorrow on the, on the news, in a sense. So Dave's just going to talk a little bit about some, some pictures of, of the... Uh, Two logistical things. And, and the vaccine uh, centres. One or things. two anecdotes, yeah. So that, well, there's a tennis and leisure centre in, in, in glorious, sunny East Devon. Um, the car park is probably the place that you have the most danger, really, when you're having a vaccination. It's, it's not the actual reaction to the vaccine. It's getting run over by somebody else or, uh, or backing your car into another car. So we do have a lot of volunteers who have been attracted into uh, helping with this service. It's been remarkable, really. We've had a lot of help, people standing out in, in minus uh, centigrade temperatures, people stand, uh, helping in the actual flow of patients in the actual building, which we'll see uh, next. And, um, and then we also have a lot of um, volunteers um, coming to help with the administration and, and loading up of that database that Claire's just described. Um, that's required quite a bit of training. We have a resuscitation pod in every um, uh, major centre like this, which has uh, a defibrillator, oxygen, intravenous fluids, adrenaline, adrenaline obviously. And uh, so far, we've only, I, as far as I know, had one occasion to use uh, this is when a patient felt um, somewhat unwell when they've left the building in the supermarket. And then instead of calling an ambulance, they, they made their way back to us and then had some adrenaline there. Then they had an ambulance pick them up. So um, all, all's well that ended well, as it were. And then uh, the pods, uh, we've got about 10 pods at Exmouth Tennis Centre. And uh, when we're fully staffed and running, we're doing around a thousand vaccinations of the Pfizer-BioNTech a day. 
partly limited by the, as I said, the parking in the space, really, not the speed of the vaccinators. This lady is one of the main coordinators for our practice and has worked heroically to get uh, people in. And then uh, that's this one of our nurses standing to attention. And then uh, some of the kit that we use, the actual vial itself, the dilution stuff and the, uh, the injecting. And then uh, I think you'll see me in my scrubs looking all ready to go and gentlemen looking a little bit apprehensive perhaps. And that's the waiting area afterwards where um, they're kept a, uh, an eye on by either a doctor or a nurse uh, for the quarter an hour. Some people try and make a runner, do a runner and leave early. My wife is good at spotting them and uh, brings them back. But apart from that, it's been a pretty um, heartwarming experience. And uh, we have um, many people bursting into tears when they've had their first jab and sometimes with the second because they feel safer. And it's a, a very positive experience generally. Um, we have had some interesting experiences with, particularly with very anxious patients. Um, some of uh, our patients with autism have been particularly anxious. Um, I'm thinking of one lad who came into the surgery with his, his mother and he really wanted the vaccine, but he was retching and rolling on the floor at one point and then we couldn't really persuade him to stay still at that point. So after the uh, clinic, Claire and I decided to go around to his home and he still wanted his vaccine. And we managed to finally corner him in the bathroom and um, give him his vaccine. At which point uh, he gave me a high five and then took me around to show me his chickens and gave me a pint of beer. So that was a very positive experience again. Uh, yesterday I was in a, um, a, a home, a care home for, for partially sighted and uh, learning disability. And uh, in, that, in that particular place, there's one young man who's um, ex extraordinary in many ways, but he wanted me to vaccinate him the first time round to the uh, tune of the um, Star Spangled Banner. We had to sing the American National Anthem. And once, um, once we got to the end, he would shout USA, USA. And on the first USA, I had to stick the vaccine in. So that was successful. So 11 weeks further on yesterday, he changed his tune literally, and we, he has collected um, some vintage antique um, Edison phonograms. He has two of these with all those cylinders of music. So we had to play one of those and uh, sing a little chant at the end, the Edison <laughs> phonograph. Um, and on the word Edison, I had to put the vaccine in. So he's had his, both his vaccine now. So you have to sometimes go to extraordinary lengths to achieve this, but um, the patient wanted it. He was consenting. It's just anxiety and you know fear, really. So there, that was... Um, so um, we'll just finish with a picture of our staff and the, if you can see the excitement and the, the sort of the energy that people are bringing to it. So it's a, it's a very positive thing and uh, we've been privileged to be part of it really. And just to say thank you for your attention. We're happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you. That was very, very interesting. And um, it's quite different to the Austrian case, I can say already before we start off with the discussion. Um, but it was really, really interesting. Um, I would say, um, if you want to, um, to ask a question or make a comment, you can either um, write in the chat or um, raise your Zoom hand. And um, if you want to make a comment and you do not want uh, the comment to be recorded, just write me a message beforehand or to Elias and we will pause the recording during your comment. Okay. I mean, I might start. Oh no, okay, I see the first hand. Katarina. Okay, hi. Um, yes, thank you so much, uh, Claire and Dave, for, for this um, fascinating talk, which as Wanda already hinted at, uh, was that, you know, really shows some of the structural differences also between UK and Austria, for example. But also I was very touched by your 
um, by your anecdotes, the, the kind of levels you go to, the personal commitment that's involved in, um, in giving people their vaccines. So, you know, that's that's really great and, and heartwarming in, in these times. Um, so thank you so much for that. I've got uh, two questions, really. One of them um, is that you, in the beginning, mentioned um, that GP practices have been um, open, well, open longer and also working on the weekends to administer these um, these vaccines in order to not dis uh, disrupt um, usual routine practice too much. Um, I was wondering if you could just um, provide us uh, with, a, with a few more insights on that. To what extent do you feel this, the, the very important vaccine program has maybe also disrupted, you know, the routine practices at all, or whether you, you feel that you've been able, you know, as a practice, been able to keep up with, with the routine um, work that you also do. Um, and then the, the second question was really around this um, fascinating aspect around the volunteers, like how, how, how were volunteers recruited? Did, you know, was there a sign up? Would they just call the practice or sign up with the national program? How, how did that work? in the UK? Yes, yeah. so um, we're less involved in the day-to-day -day running of the practice now, but um, obviously COVID has affected everything in this country, as I'm sure it has in yours. So the um, practices have had to be running in a different way, and a lot of what they do has been moved to telephone and um, video yeah. calls and things like that. Uh, for a bit, I was also working, we have a, a national um, scheme called NHS 111, which is where people can phone first of all before they phone their GP, especially out of hours, but also on the COVID clinical assessment line. So we've also been having a national system taking calls about COVID. But the practices have having to obviously adapt to working with people with potential COVID, having what we call um, hot areas, red areas, um, but also a lot of people not wanting to come in. Um, so it has been difficult times and a lot of people probably have stayed away anyway, because they've been so worried about catching COVID, about going out um, and thinking that the doctors are too busy. So um, the Honiton practice has tried very hard to keep running as well as it can. And we've been particularly fortunate because Dave and myself are, are less, uh, less working in routine work. So we have been more available for vaccinating as have about four of our other retired colleagues. So what happened in the UK was when COVID sort of started, our general medical council, re-licensed re a lot of doctors who'd retired. So normally we have to go through appraisal and revalidation on a regular basis, which Dave and I have always um, kept ours up, but quite a few of our colleagues had sort of retired, but um, they were got re-licensed. So they were then in a position to be come available to come and help with vaccinating programs and other aspects as well of, um, of the work. Um, in order to take part in the vaccination programme as a vaccinator, you have to do certain modules, particularly about the vaccinations, uh, about the whole um, vaccination against COVID, but then also about each different type of vaccination before you're allowed to actually give it. So um, that's what's happened from the medical point of view. So, and this, we've decided, we, we do the um, Exmouth Tennis Centre on, we, it, well, any day of the week we've done that. Um, and as I say, we've been fortunate, we've been able to provide quite a lot of retired doctors, so the, the, the usual GPs can keep doing their GP work, but we can't really run these sorts of clinics with the necessary social distancing and things like that during a working week. So we do Saturdays and Sundays uh, in the Honiton practice. Uh, we're already used to, we've always done flu vaccine clinics in that way, so we have quite a sort of wide um, experience of it. Thank you. I would also explain that <clears throat> uh, general practitioners in Britain are technically self-employed and they, they subcontract their, their services to the government, to the NHS. The NHS is our main employer, so effectively we do work for the NHS, but um, when something like vaccinations come along, it's, it's a, it is an opt-in uh, decision for the practice. They do not have to provide vaccination services and they are paid on a, a, a per capita basis for providing vaccine services. Up until now, it's been mainly the childhood vaccines and the shingles vaccine in the older person but, and the flu vaccine. But um, even so, with the COVID vaccination, it is a service that a practice doesn't have to provide. Hence, the national service takes up the, the slack, as it were, 
but most practices want to take part and have taken part um, and are paid around 15 euros per head of person that receives uh, the first vaccination and again the second vaccination. So um, that money pays in a sense for the extra hours that they're having to provide, which is people like us sometimes coming in. In terms of the volunteers, at the start of the, the whole pandemic, the, the NHS did put out an appeal for people who would register to be voluntary in, in whatever capacity. And it was quite overwhelming, the people who put their hands up. At that time, there wasn't so many options for things for people to do because they hadn't been vaccinated and older people were at risk, et cetera. But of course, with, with the um, progress of the vaccination rollout, more people have been taken into the role of volunteer. I mean, in terms of our own practice, it's been quite often word of mouth and friends of administrators and doctors in the practice. Children of doctors have been coming in to help run the vaccine clinics. Students who haven't been able to get back to university are coming along. So it's sort of a snowball effect, really. Uh, but we aren't really short of people who have volunteered. Again, for the car parks and things, it's been provided through local uh, groups, sometimes by Rotary and, and other sort of, you know, beneficent organisations. We also have um, volunteer drivers who will drive um, particularly older people to the vaccination centres, both the national ones and the local ones. Um, we have a, an organisation in Honiton that particularly, um, and when people can book their vaccination, they can also book the driver as well. So it's been hmm. really just, just such a wonderful you talk about solidarity we probably tend to use more like community responsibility social responsibility community spirit and there's just been so much of that with with the um, with the vaccine rollout thanks that was very interesting also the re reference to community spirit now i really like that and Celine, you also have a comment Yep. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Claire and Dave. This was really, really interesting to also kind of hear from direct like ex experience, basically. And it, for a person, the relevant countries from your Austria and Germany, and hearing what you're experiencing sounds like utopia, to be honest. So I'm uh, slightly jealous, but also very fascinated. Um, I basically have two questions. Um, and so one of them is, I thought it was really fascinating how you told us that some people on a second call, they would kind of be less hesitant to get the vaccination, they would still decide to come in. I was wondering whether they told you kind of or communicated to you why they didn't want to come in the, in the beginning, were they just scared or were they kind of, was there any kind of like mistrust, was there any bigger issue you noticed, so that's the first one. And then how did you take that hesitancy away basically, was it just because they knew you was it. Do you feel like trust really mattered, just like your, your view? And then the second question, um, I, I'm also very, I find it really cool how all these licenses were kind of reinstated or that like doctors who had retired were re-licensed. Who reached out to those people? Was that also word of mouth, just calling colleagues who, for example, you knew were didn't have their license anymore? Or was this from like a central government place? Thanks so much. This was a great talk. Thank you. Um, I'll try a little bit about the hesitancy. I mean, uh, the worry about side effects is, is, is fairly high up on the list. And the idea that I will wait until other people have tried the vaccine before I put myself forward is also expressed. There are perhaps some who are expressing a degree of paranoia, which is a conspiracy type theory that Bill Gates is still out to control us by injecting microchips or something. They are quite uh, rare, to be fair, and I don't think we do have much luck in persuading such people. But those who have got fears um, often do respond to um, someone they trust, uh, which can, I suppose, top of the pile is probably their general practitioner, but uh, a well-qualified and well-known nurse and and a well-trained reception person can actually help a lot to help people ease over their, their anxieties and move them forward. Um, there was some uh, data published today on the BBC uh, that in Leicester, uh, an area of, of Britain with a large ethnic minority, and, and, and a really large ethnic minority, uh, there's a, high, a higher degree of hesitancy. And 
uh, local GPs have been phoning patients personally, and apparently they've been seeing around 70%, 70 percent, 70 percent of these hard to reach uh, folk coming forward for vaccination after a discussion with a, a respected member of the community, their GP. But we have champions who are also standing up and uh, speaking out, and particularly when it's an issue of um, religion and uh, perhaps uh, fear of the content of the vaccine. Ramadan is in process at the moment and the issues over fasting um, and, and, and pure language issues. You know, we, we still operate mainly in English in, in the UK, but obviously we have a lot of uh, Urdu speakers and, and Arabic speakers as well. So uh, we, we have made efforts in these areas to, to really target and help these groups you know, move forward with, by the sounds of it, quite good success. Do you have a question? Yes. So basically, the General Medical Council, or who licenses all doctors in, in the UK, literally emailed or wrote letters to all these people who'd retired within the last couple of years or so and told them they were back on the register. So they didn't have to do anything. I mean, once they were told they were back on the register, they then had to do things if they wanted to work because we had to, um, they had to go through lots of modules. We have a a national e-learning for health um, system where there are standardized modules on all sorts of things about getting back into you know, work as a doctor um, and that's where we also do our vaccine training so depending on what people were going to do some people went back to their old jobs um, some people did test and trace some people worked for the covid clinical assessment line some people started vaccinating so there was special training up-to-date training for them to get back you know, in harness, so to speak. We also have to be um, insured. Um, some of our stuff is done by the government now. So hospitals in the UK are, um, we have what's called crown indemnity. Um, so the, the, the government basically pays for that in a sense. But up until recently, GPs have had to pay for their own uh, indemnity. Uh, and if I tell you, it got to the point where we were having to pay Four thousand pounds, so what, six thousand euros or whatever, to um, to work, a day to work a for half a day a week. Yeah. It became it became almost impossible. Yeah. So our defence unions have also been working as well with the government, saying that they would uh, indemnify us much more and things like that to make it possible for people to work. So we're insured, basically. So we're insured, yes, yeah. by the government more now. Yeah. So yes, so some people obviously di you didn't have to take up. The option to come back to work um, you know it weren't it wasn't compulsory but it meant that some people who felt they still had skills they could use were glad to do it uh, in the you know in the pandemic Hope thank that you answers. i think uh Celine nodded with his head made like a thank you sign um that, that's so interesting also um, I, I will go ahead with the question because I, I don't see any hands raised right now. Um, so uh, we, we have conducted an interview study um, in Austria in October last year. So it was quite some time before um, the vaccination program started, but still there is um, a lot of vaccine hesitants reported in Austria. So um, like second thoughts regarding side effects, et cetera, are quite present. They are also regularly on the media um, currently, especially with the AstraZeneca and the thrombose cases. Um, so um, what we also found in the interviews that people actually mostly trust doctors they know, like either their own general practitioners or other doctors they have in their friend circle or family. So um, that was particularly interesting to me that um, the UK um, like really tried to, to make personal contact via phone calls. Um, and, and I wanted to ask if you, as I, um, did I understand correctly, but that was also like the first contact that was made. It was not the national program via the website or something, but it was the general practitioners. And then um, I have a second question because that was also very interesting to me. You made a side remark about um, illegal immigrants who are also encouraged to get vaccinated. And I wanted to ask um, how this is happening or if you have had any experiences with this. Yeah, thank you. Um, what's the first point? Um, about contacting people, first of all. So 
as Dave explained, it was up to individual general practices, uh, groups of general practices, whether they actually decided to take part in the vaccination at, at all. And in our area, general practitioners are very involved with their communities and were very keen to do that and wanted to get it, you know, get it rolling and protect their protect their populations, really. So it's um, we did start, I mean, we started by having our, I mean, it has taken a lot of time and effort because we've had our volunteers, our staff, our doctors, our nurses, everyone has sort of thrown themselves in to contacting people. Um, and uh, if we have had people who have been a bit hesitant, then often they would be put to a doctor to actually phone and call. And some people have very legitimate reasons, you know, especially if they have had reactions to previous vaccinations. And we've had to, again, go out of our way to make sure that they're treated in as safe a way as possible and things. So um, certainly to start with, that was how a lot of it was working, literally by us phoning people. Um, so that's, and, yes. And the hard to reach groups, yes, uh, the see. illegal immigrant and um, the homeless, um, to be fair, that, that's not a particular issue in our area, but uh, my understanding is that it's, it's um, uh, certainly a uh, uh, focus of the national scheme uh, and teams are mobilised to, to actually help through the contacts that people have about uh, refugee and uh, illegal immigrant uh, groups. I guess it's a, a, a bit of, you know, uh, yeah. local knowledge and, you know, who, who people you might know, etc. So it's a detective work, really, a bit like we do for some of our reluctant patients, you know, that it's that similar sort of thing. There is um, they have been taking out mobile, yeah. mobile teams as well to go around like for homeless people and to go to places where they think yeah. that there might be people who, you know, are in difficult situations and things. We, we did actually get asked to do that the other day, but we were already doing something, another thing, so yeah, we couldn't. So it would have been quite interesting to see what it was like. But yeah, um, but yeah they're just trying wherever possible to get just as many people vaccinated as yeah. possible, really. Mm. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Um, I have a question in the chat by Antonia Girardi. Yeah. Um, so she's asking what happens if a person gets an appointment for vaccination on both the national and the local system? Can the person then choose which one to take? And uh, why are there two systems? Very, very good question. And um, yeah, it does happen. Um, I think particularly for the very older people, um, they haven't would really have engaged probably with systems that needed them to respond to, um, to texts or to letters and to online stuff. So um, a lot of the, I don't want to be um, ageist about this because obviously some people who are older are very good at that. But um, so I think it was really just so that we got as many people involved. Obviously lots of practices in some areas don't provide the service. So they needed to have a national system for that anyway. Um, but it does give people a choice. Um, and it may be that um, some places are easier for people to get to, our timings are easier. But yes, I mean, I did spend two hours phoning people and they all said, the race course, I'm going to the race course. The and my heart sank because they were going to the national system at the local race course. Um, and they all said, oh, I'd much rather come to you in the practice in much more convenient. But at that point, it was too complicated. They, it was better for them to stick with what they'd already booked. But occasionally we do have people who try and sneak in, even though they've made an appointment with the national service and they get called by us or they try and Okay. juggle them both Again. and try and work out which is the best one <laughs> occasionally that can get confused because we would usually give people the same dose the second time um so some people have actually made appointments for the different ones because they hadn't really realized that so um I mean, we do occasionally give the second dose differently if we have to we have had bad. occasion where patients who had their first pfizer biontech at the tennis center who are too ill to come back three eight, 12 weeks later, um, have had AstraZeneca at home. Mm. And that's a pragmatic decision that the, the NHS has decided that mm. to have two, even if they're different, it's still two vaccines that are probably going to work well. Mm. So it, it's really to try, I think the two systems is to, to make sure everyone in the country has access. Relative, I think we, everyone was supposed to have access within so many miles of where they lived mm. to get vaccinated as well. Um, so, 
So yes, it, it's had some confusions, but overall, and we don't know until the person's had the vaccination, we don't know if they've just been called, that they've already been called. It's only once they've had the vaccination and it's on the system that we know that then we don't need to worry about them. But it's the GPs who agreed to do the, the vaccinations had the responsibility to contact all their patients in the groups and to make sure that they, and you know, I, I certainly know the staff at our practice, a lot of them have been going over and above, you know, trying to persuade people who they see particularly who are at risk, who've been a bit reluctant to, or not just been able to get in and things, so. And the IT has been very effective in as much that once it's registered on outcomes for health, the national system, the, pra the general practice is emailed effectively and the email goes into the patient notes at the practice level. So the general practitioner can check the next few days and see that a vaccine has been given. And um, that, that helps communication. All, um, everyone in the UK now has access to their medical records as well. So you can sign up and once you've just proved your identity, you can access your own medical records. So you can actually access your, your immunization status as well and things, um, plus any other medical records and things. Which might be useful for um, yeah. travel purposes yeah. eventually <laughs> that people can electronically demonstrate that they have received two vaccines. Obviously, that's a, a, an issue for that's debate issue, yes. in many countries as yeah. to whether vaccine passports are going to uh, uh, become a necessity. Mm -hmm. But um, I suspect it might be for certain things, functions like travel. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, is there another question or comment? Because otherwise I might... I might go with one, um, because now uh, I was wondering if there is a discussion about um, how to approach people who have not been vaccinated by now, because there should be some people who just don't want to have a vaccine, I guess. And is there some discussion about it or like how often would you call people who are not willing to get the vaccine? Like, because there can also be this like social pressure on someone and in the end it Probably, probably it is a personal decision. Yeah. Well, as you can see, I mean, as we we reckon, we've got at least about ninety five percent of people so far. I mean, every now and then we'll get someone. We we got a phone call from some friends a couple of weeks ago, and they've been stuck in Portugal for six months. Strange. And they're both around eighty, and they've literally just arrived back in the UK. We're having to quarantine, but they were desperate to get their vaccine and didn't know what to do. Um, so fortunately, we managed to get them sorted out um, fairly just in, at the end there. I mean, we've tried to get the balance between encouraging people and making it as easy as possible for them to have the vaccine by visiting them, by offering them appointments when, it, when it's convenient to them and things, without hopefully bullying them. But some, some people have felt a bit pressurised and we've had quite a lot of people who never thought they would have it. We have quite a lot of people who haven't, wouldn't have a flu vaccine normally, but they've just felt the weight of the COVID, the weight of the sort of mm. pandemic on them um, and the social pressures and just the thought of never getting back to normal if they didn't has brought them forward. We've had people who can't have it at the moment because they're having certain treatments. So there will always be a small percentage of people who literally can't. We've had, as you're probably aware about the issues of anaphylaxis, so we were told not to use Pfizer. They gradually um, honed it down a bit. So we began to, if it was just purely a food allergy, we were able to use Pfizer and things. But if it was something else, we were using AstraZeneca. But even then we had some people who still had potential that they might have allergies to that. So we set up a special clinic where we'd actually observe them for half an hour afterwards. Um, so we managed to do quite a few that way. We have got a very small number who are so concerned about their potential for anaphylaxis that they're going to need to be done in a, in a hospital specialist setting. So we will have a very small percentage, which they're organizing at the moment. Yeah. Um, but that's obviously been another thing. Um, yeah. I mean, we've had, people, we've had people having photos taken of themselves to prove to people they're having it and to encourage their, you know, their families to have it yeah. as well. So, um, I've been surprised that the lack of concern over the AstraZeneca side effects with the thrombosis blood clot situation 
we're, we're in the throes now of doing second doses for people in their 20s quite often and nobody's really refused <laughs> no. i mean very few questions i was surprised myself i think it might be something to do with the degree of public sort of announcements through the the, the vaccination committee and then the bbc with the medical experts who are who are certainly uh, high profile in the in the uk um they've provided balanced reassurance and as you know we have stopped first doses for under 30, 30 year olds now um, and we're providing uh, Moderna or Pfizer BioNTech but um, it hasn't seemed to be a huge issue in terms of uh, backlash and, and refusal so again perhaps a difference to to the continental sort of uh, attitude it's interesting mm. I think if your work Vonda helps throw light on that. It would be very helpful indeed, actually, as, as to what works as well. Yeah, there are. I, I think there could be great work about comparing these cases because there is so many differences, really. Yeah. Um, is there another question or comment? Um, okay, I think uh, Antonia was first and then Konstantin. Thank you, you both. It's so interesting to listen to your um, to your talk. Um, I really liked when you mentioned how the vaccine itself has to be handled in practice, like the shaking, and it's it's kind of sounded a little bit complicated, but uh, yeah, it's a really interesting point. I think, and I never actually thought more about it. But yes, it's way more complicated than the flu vaccine. They they come in preloaded syringes and really it's a question of roll your sleeve up and pop it in this is a, a much more complicated uh, process of questions first and then getting people ready and then getting the vaccine uh, ready and drawn into a syringe that's why it's taking five times longer virtually than than the flu campaign yeah sorry yeah. Tim. i think that's a, a really interesting point and I'm, I'm i'm glad i heard about it now um, but I wanted to ask if the if there are discussions in UK, like um, uh, if the vaccine or vaccination status is somehow bound to privileges in in social life or like you mentioned before in in traveling, but also within the UK. Well, it's um, very topical, and it's going to. Um... I don't quite know how it's going to run. I mean, we've just started reopening a few things like pubs, outdoors and things. And people were saying, well, we're not going to be showing our vaccine passports to go there. And, and in no. fact, a lot of the population who go to pubs probably haven't got their vaccines yet anyway. But um, I suspect there will be some sort of vaccine passport or needing to show it for certain travels and all sorts of things like that. Um, there's a big, big question over here about jobs and whether or not your employer can insist that you have the vaccine. If you're going to work in a care home, can you, are you going to be allowed to work in a care home or a hospital and without being vaccinated? So there are quite a lot of issues to, um, to be looked at and things. Um, as I say, you know, overall, we find people are just keen to have the vaccine rather than not keen to have it, but there will always be a small percentage of people who, who won't be able to or won't want to have it. In terms of That's occupation, um, there, there is some precedent mm. in the UK in as much that hospital staff particularly have to have hepatitis, proof of hepatitis B uh, uh, immunity, either through natural infection that they may have had or through vaccination. And uh, they're not permitted to work in areas where, where blood products might be uh, you know, exchanged effectively. So it's not so outrageous to suggest that COVID vaccination might be uh, uh, compulsory for, for the healthcare sector and probably the social care sector, you know, where in care homes particularly, where there's been devastation, as you may have heard in, in, in the UK in the early parts, uh, that, uh, that that's, those staff should be indeed vaccinated. And I suspect that will probably be stipulated. Yeah. Yes. And I think, I mean, I think, people trying to open up other things like um, play, indoor places like theatres or cinemas or, or sports things. There may start to be some sort of thing there 
Um, I'm not quite sure whether you have any, we also have testing now in the UK. I mean, obviously we have testing if you think you've got symptoms and you can get a PCR, a polymerase chain reaction uh, test. Um, and now they're fairly easy to get. Again, we have to probably drive somewhere for it, but it's pretty simple. But for several months, I mean, since certainly beginning of the year, Dave, we, we do twice weekly um, lateral flows for working. And if we go into a care home or into a centre, we have to have done one that day within 24 hours. And it has to be, it's communicated to the NHS and it's communicated to the care home that we're going to. So they know that we're as safe as we can be. And since this term, they've all went back, but since children went back to school, the school children are also doing twice weekly lateral flows and their families can. And for the last couple of weeks, anyone in the UK now um, can actually ask for the lateral flows to have at home to test themselves. So we know it's not a perfect test and there's a lot of issues about tests and what result you're expecting and probability, but it's certainly something else that can help in your in your sort of armour against COVID, basically. Another weapon, yeah. Armour weapon, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. 